Tonight it's about suborbital and space tourism, and um, we are uh, we're happy to have four panelists this evening. We have Faith uh, Vilas from the Planetary Science Institute. We have Kaki Rodway, McKee, Rodway, Rodway, there we go, um, from XCOR. We have Mike Machula from the FAA, and we have Kevin, whose last name escapes me at the minute, Heath, right, Kevin Heath, just like the bar, um, from Waypoint. And um, so last night you heard a lot about the, the commercial crew and commercial cargo and that sort of thing. And one of the things that I think is most exciting about what's happening in space is the possibility that common people could fly in space or common people could fly payloads in space. Uh, high school students and graduate students and, and uh, people who are you know, artists and uh, musicians and that sort of thing. And I think eventually that that's really going to happen and some of the people here are paving the way to make that sort of thing happen. And so tonight we bring these four panelists and um, as always um, we're going to uh, hold the questions to the end. Um, let's see, well, any other preambles I want to say. Oh yeah, last night um, we had two panelists that were retired astronauts and one who was not, so we made him a, uh, an honorary astronaut for the evening. I guess we'll go ahead and do that now, you're honorary astronauts. Do you feel any different? Oh yeah? Space cadet. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm not going to bother with bios and all that kind of stuff. We're going to ask everybody to introduce themselves with three words. So you get your three-word bio, and think about it. Kaki, you did this last time, so you probably. So I'm exempt. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and with that, I guess uh, you guys could either do rock, paper, scissors for who goes first, or I could just start from one end and go, go to the other. Any idea? Okay, Faith, uh, Faith Vilas from the Planetary Science Institute is going to talk to us about science. When you stand up. We'll give everybody about 15 minutes and then we'll do Q&A until the energy runs out. Oh, you want to do khaki first? All right, khaki, then you're going to have to open your own slides. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. All right. How is everybody on a, it's Saturday, right? <laughs> They're right exactly. That's my life. Um, okay, all right, so, um, well, that's a bright light. <laughs> I'm Kaki Rodway. I am uh, the Director of Payload Sales and Operations at XCOR. That means I handle the research education missions of XCOR's business. Um, so, you can get me on a soapbox, talk about the great science that we're going to do on, um, on links on the suborbital vehicle, as well as the education that we're going to do. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, I just remembered, I forgot. Um, I've got a fifth grade science teacher who's going to teach his students how to build experiments and then put those on, on links and fly them within the school year. So, uh, and I should have, a, I should have a, a slide of Steve Heck, but I, I don't. So I'm just mental note. That it's, uh, that it's on here. But what I'm going to do is, is talk to you about where we are in the Lynx development. Um, right now we're, we're in Mojave, so uh, we're putting it together there. But I'm also going to talk to you about the payloads and the experiments and the, uh, the research, the education that's going to go on Lynx. And Faith is going to follow um, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt a couple slides that, that you're going to see and say, well, Faith is going to talk about this. So um, let's just let's get started. So XCOR, what do, what do we do? Who are we? Um, we were founded in 1999, and uh, we're, we're based out in Mojave, California right now. Uh, within the year, we will be moving to Midland, Texas, um, the other side of this country that you all call Texas. Um, but... Uh, but West Texas, not too many places you can fire a rocket engine and fire and, and launch rocket planes. And uh, Mojave's great for that, and Midland is another great place for that. And uh, you're going to talk about FAA spaceports, so you're going to talk about uh, what it takes to be uh, an FAA spaceport. But uh, XCOR was started as a rocket engine company. Our four founders came from Rotary Rocket, 
and uh, they were the propulsion team with Rotary. Our first, this is our first engine here. Um, let me take this and show this. We called it the tea cart, and it sat on a little tea cart, a rolling, a rolling cart. Um, again, we, we built it just to show that a private company could build a rocket engine, and um, what we did is, because it, it was on wheels, it was really portable, we'd take it to elementary schools, to county fairs, we took it to a conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, and fired it in the hotel ballroom with fire marshal approval and hotel manager approval. But uh, this was great. It was a great day because we got some of our first investors that way. Um, the idea being that people could see how, could actually see a rocket engine. And, and up close, you could stand about 10 feet away and uh, see the rocket plume. From here, we went to uh, rocket planes. Our chief engineer had a long easy, and uh, the engine was kind of broke, and they all said, uh, hey, let's put another engine on there. Well, they put two engines on there. Took the piston engine out and put two LOX alcohol rocket engines on there, and it, it was just a demonstrator. It was just a show that a private company, not the government, could build a rocket plane. We had no idea what it was going to do except fly. We knew that much, but it wound up flying 26 times, breaking a world record. Our first pilot was Dick Rutan, and uh, it was actually Dick who, who broke the record, which was the longest distance flight of a plane in its class. It was only two, 10 miles, and uh, Dick, Dick got out, and he said, that's the shortest long distance flight I've ever done. <laughs> but uh, but that, was, that was our start. And uh, from there, we went on and built uh, bigger rocket engines. This is a LOX methane engine that we did with NASA as a subcontractor to ATK. This was our second rocket engine, our rocket plane, rather, and uh, this was done for an outfit called the Rocket Racing League. They were going to do a NASCAR in the sky. The thing is, they, they saw the Easy Rocket, and they said, hey, that's really cool. Let's, let's, let's do this NASCAR-like thing. And um, so we put this plane together. Again, it was, a, it was already existing airframe, a velocity airframe, and we took the piston engine out. Um, we also took the, the two back seats out. Um, put the LOX tank in the fuselage and put a 1,800-pound thrust LOX kerosene engine on there. Lots of lessons learned between these two planes and what we're doing now with our, our Lynx, our suborbital plane. Um, part of, so we flew, we, we flew the Easy Rocket 26 times. We flew the X-Racer 40 times. So together, these, these two planes, uh, 66 times, and uh, when 2000 came, um, we actually had more rocket engine firings and plane tests than anybody else. Um, so from there, we've gone to uh, the Lynx. We're building our suborbital reusable launch vehicle. This is what we call the 5K18. It's the Lynx engine. It's a I guess a, a next generation from the X Racer engine. A lot of lessons learned on on this, and uh, I'll talk about this. But it, the X Racer had a pump-fed piston pump, in fact, because our engineers, well, they weren't so happy with uh, with turbo pumps. They're expensive. They're not that reliable. They don't uh, they don't have long life. So our engineers, being car guys, know that piston pumps last a long time, um, and you know in your car and you want your car to start and so the piston the piston pump works so now on the x-racer we had a fuel pump on the lynx we're going to have a fuel and a LOX pump and that pump was also something that united launch alliance liked and uh, since uh let's see where are we now 2014 i think for the last four years we've had a contract with ula to build a LOX hydrogen engine with uh, our piston pump technology. Before we get started, let's just, let's talk, I, yeah, I guess I gather you guys talked uh, last, last night about commercial suborbital commercial space. Crew, Did, suborbital. Okay. Commercial crew. Commercial crew and what's, so what's going on with, uh, with the suborbital space? Well, it's, you know, not just XCOR. Um, we have, you know, Virgin Galactic, we have Mastin. There's a number of companies that are building these suborbital vehicles. What's so great about them? They're reusable. They're highly reusable. So you have high flight rates. 
you have rapid turnaround. We're looking at a, at a turnaround of about uh, two hours. Uh, actually, maybe even less. I think uh, call-up time of about two hours. Um, turnaround is, uh, we think we can do it in about an hour. One of the, one of the criteria for the X-Racer, in fact, was, uh, was a quick turnaround. Like I said, they wanted to do NASCAR, so they wanted to come in and do pit stops. And uh, we had to do, we had to show and demonstrate that we could do a pit stop in, um, in 10 minutes or less. We did it in less than nine minutes. So, uh, like I said, lessons learned. So this is not our first rodeo. Um, again, we can fly on demand, and uh, I think Faith will talk about this, but uh, the, the cool thing about Lynx is that it's, uh, if you're the, you're the passenger or, or if you have the payload, it's your mission. So you, you tell us where you want to go. You tell us what you want to look at. If you're a passenger or a participant, rather, you want to go up and say you're, you're flying out of Mojave, for example, um, and you want to look at the Pacific Ocean, we'll have you look at the Pacific Ocean. If you want to look at the Grand Canyon, you can look at the Grand Canyon. If you want to, Faith will talk about this, you want to go and you want to look up and you want to point at something very specific, we can do that for you. So that's, that's what uh, is really unique about Lynx compared to the other companies. Uh, we can do unmanned payloads. We can do human-tended payloads. Um, and uh, all this is really low cost compared to what's out there now. So this is our vehicle history and, uh, and roadmap. So as I said, the, you've had the Easy Rocket, the X Racer. Now we're on the Lynx Mark I. It's a prototype. Uh, we want to get to market. We want to we want to do it um, as quick as possible. I always my analogy is always the uh, Motorola's first cell phone. Um, if anybody remembers, it was the size of a briefcase and heavy as all get out. Um, and, you know, all it could do was make phone calls. Well, guess what? This fits in my pocket and can do about a thousand things. Um, just, let's just show the proof. Let's just show the proof of concept, get it out there, and, uh, and get going. So we're going to be flying uh, and in flight test by uh, end of this year. So after that comes Mark II. It's a higher performance, um, but very much, very much like the prototype. Um, primary differences are... Well, we'll take lessons learned from Mark I, but also we'll have a composite LUX tank and uh, some other components that are lighter weight. And then from there, we'll go to Mark III, and I'll, I'll show you all this in a minute. Um, Mark III will have, essentially have this, uh, this pod on top that can do a small satellite launch or hold an instrument in there to either do planetary observation or, or Earth observation or instrumentation development that needs to be exposed to the environment. So this is Lynx. Um, it's a small airplane. It's two seats, pilot plus one, and it's um, it will have uh, about uh, five payload locations. And I'm just going to read my notes because I always forget. I always I, f I forget things at the grocery store. So if I don't if I don't tell you this this stuff. Uh, It'll be there, but oh yeah, uh, horizontal takeoff and horizontal landing. That's uh, that's that's most important. Aircraft-like operations. So we don't we don't use range. We use air traffic control, and uh, we can take off out of a, a runway that's about uh, minimum 7,500 feet. So we don't we don't need a lot of runway, but we like the we like the runway aspect, longer runway. But uh, I talked about the high tempo ops, all that all that stuff. Um, this is where we are in development. So you see here, this is the fuselage. Inside the fuselage is the LOX tank. You have back here the, the propulsion system. This is a truss system that we have, we've done it on Lynx, we've, we've done it on um, all the other vehicles. And what this enables us to do, and right now in, uh, in building the airframe, we're also in parallel um, testing the rocket engine. So we have a test fuselage, a test LOX tank, and the flight propulsion system is on this truss attached to the, uh, the, the test fuselage. When we get done testing the propulsion, then we'll put, we'll just, we'll just take the truss off of the fuselage and put it onto the, fus the flight fuselage. Here you have the wing strikes. This holds the kerosene. Um, then you have the pressure vessel, the pressure cabin here. Um, this is, uh, well, I'll, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. I just want to give you, show you the, the main components and then 
various inside things. This is also on our website, uh, the reaction control system here. There'll be 12 of those. And then various other, uh, you know, components. Like I said, it's aircraft-like, so ailerons and elevons in the back. This is a video of our uh, propulsion um, test. Actually, it just reminds me, do we have a, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of video, uh, audio on here. This one, we don't want it too loud, I'm, but the next video, I think, I think we're going to want it. Fairly loud. This is a 67 second engine run. Uh, right now, it's the longest duration engine run that we've had. So it's a setup. You always think, oh, yeah. Six, Continues five, the countdown. <laughs> four, three, two, it's just, it's running very rich. That's why you have that black smoke coming out at the beginning. But this is, uh, this is the X-ray, the Lynx engine. You see, there'll be four engine chambers here. This is just we're just firing it on one right now. Um, it's on the it's on the test stand. You can see it bolted down to the concrete pad. This is in in broad daylight. I know it kind of looks a little little like it might be nighttime, but uh, apertures turned down really low to get the brightness of the plume. And this is done out in Mojave, and it's just a it's a long engine run. We we recently put the the full scale LOX tank in the fuselage and that f that lux tank can hold a three minute engine run and so we're uh, we're working up to that right now and uh, testing pretty much every week so we uh, we'll go to that quite shortly actually the longer longer duration uh, full, full duration engine run at least So that's our main propulsion. This is our reaction control system. This is the thruster. Its, uh, its ancestor is, again, the, the T-card engine, the 15-pound um, thrust nitrous oxide ethane engine that we got some of our first investors with. <laughs> Avionics are going to look like this. Um, a lot of these are you know, very, very much uh, aviation instrumentation. There's nothing really different about this. It's a, it's a plane. Um, this is actually what it looked like. What's what it looks like uh, fairly recently. I think uh, some of these are fully populated now, um, but uh, but that's ready to go. Ready to go into the vehicle. Uh, aerodynamics. We've done some. We've done a lot of wind tunnel tests. We got some uh, a cooperative research agreement with uh, Air Force Research Lab at Wright Patterson. They got us into the NASA Marshall wind tunnel, the hypersonic wind tunnel. So. We, I think this was this was taken there, um, and we got Tristan. We got stuck again on the same slide. Hit escape. Okay. Okay. I might need my glasses for this one. There we go. So right here, this one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it doesn't like that. So, uh, so yeah, here's a after the wind tunnel test, we did some modifications of the design, and, and, and actually, I don't, you can kind of see them here. We put some fences underneath the wings. Um, so, you know, right now, the doing the wing design, uh, finishing that up. Um, here's the flight fuselage. Quite exciting, right? Um, here's the full-scale LOX tank going into the test stand. You can see how big it is. Basically, the, all the fuselage is is, um, is the LOX tank. So holds a, holds three minutes of liquid oxygen. Four minutes? Okay. So we'll go quick. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the cockpit that I was talking about. It's in development. We've done uh, fit checks on this. Uh, wing strike. Landing gear test. Um, here's our estimated schedule. I'll just <laughs> no. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is what we're looking at. Uh, so second quarter initiation of the uh, of the flight test program, putting in, putting the integration together, and then low altitude flights in third quarter and uh, high altitude flights in fourth quarter. So next year commencement of commercial flights. 
uh, payloads. This is my favorite part. So we've got five locations. Uh, this is the Mark III. This is the pod on top that I was talking about. External, we've got payload C. This will go on Mark I. Um, <clears throat> and then inside, there's two. This is the right seat, um, but you're going to do a secondary payload here behind the pilot seat that uh, you can have a, a person or a, or a payload sitting here and still have the secondary there. This profile for Mark I, uh, as I said, it's, it's lower performance. It, we're looking at about 50, 58 kilometers in altitude, but uh, horizontal takeoff, um, engine cutoff, about three minutes, and then, uh, and then it glides up. So uh, this is what Faith is going to talk about, but this is, um, this is the Atta armrest camera that uh, Faith and her colleague Luke Solit are working on. They came out, with some, they came out themselves with some students from, uh, actually, I was going to say the Citadel, but various locations in South Carolina. And they, uh, they did some fit checks. So they um, affixed this to the side of the, the cockpit mock-up and uh, tested it out, including getting in, in and out. This is something that uh, Todd Smith is, uh, is coming to us through, uh, well, uh, APL, Johns Hopkins. Um, he just wants to measure basic electromagnetic fields outside and inside the vehicle. This will go in payload A. Uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is doing a uh, microgravity biology experiment using mice. Uh, Bioharness, Southwest Research Institute, is going to uh, fly. I love this picture of Dan Durden in his underwear. Um, but uh, you, see, you see Dan sort of all rigged up there. He's, um, they're going to fly, and they're going to take, uh, take basic, basic body measurements. Again, this is this is Dan in his box of rocks, so he wants to measure uh, characteristics of regolith activity in microgravity environments. Um, Purdue University, Stephen Collicott has a whole class um, that is doing what he calls zero gravity flight experiments, not just on XCOR, but he's building experiments that are going to go on pretty much every single suborbital vehicle in existence, in, and then the ISS and parabolic flights. So uh, he's got students who are building this experiment. Basic stuff, it's going to go in payload C, temperature pressure measurements. Um, TechShot has a, this, this microscope that can fit, again, nice and comfortably behind payload A. Um, this, uh, and, and a variation of this is flown on, uh, or is on ISS, um, this camera, this microscope here. So they're going to fly it. Suborbit, floating water bridge. Uh, this is an interesting. When you get two beakers filled with water and you give them an electrical charge, it forms this this water bridge right here. Um, you get the beakers close enough together. They uh, it wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to form in microgravity, but they put it in in a parabolic flight and actually found that it actually does form. But then it starts to dissipate. But what you don't see here is that it starts to come back together. So if we give them a longer microgravity time, Mark, Mark 1 will give them about 105 seconds. This was like 17 seconds. Um, they might be on to something. They might find out. It's a, it's a water dynamic experiment, which we don't know a lot about water dynamics. And this is something that's being made uh, at Texas A&M. It's, uh, it's basically just an open source hardware that can go behind payload A. Or it, it, is, it is payload A. It's, it's the rack. And then Mark II, higher performance. So you're looking at high altitude science. You're looking at things like looking at uh, terrestrial gamma ray flashes. You're looking at uh, noctilucent clouds, which form at 80 kilometers. Uh, both of these form at about 60, 60 80, 100 kilometers, things that we don't know about. Um, atmospheric scientists call this region, the 50 to 100 kilometer range, the ignorosphere, because um, we don't know anything about it. We're either flying through it with the sounding rockets or the balloons don't get high enough. So now, for suborbital science, we can get them right there. We can get them in situ measurements. We can really look at stuff. I mean, they can, they can characterize these clouds and measure them, the methane, the carbon dioxide. Um, we can get a handle on what's going on here at Earth. And uh, Mark III. So here's, again, here's the pod with a, with a satellite launch. Um, Faith is going to talk about this. This is, this is their Mark II camera that, uh, well, it's not a camera. It's a telescope. Um, so it's going to do planetary observations and uh, look at stuff up, and then small satellite launch. Um, this is something that I just, in talking about suborbital science, um, the thing is, 
you know, for the scientists, and, and this, this comes out of sort of the, the, the biology, life sciences end of things, but it, it tracks well with atmospheric science. Um, it also tracks well with just kind of any science that we do that's, that's space-based. Um, we know what happens here on Earth. We know what happens in orbit with, uh, with, with these systems. What we don't know is what happens in between. And that's where suborbital research education can uh, can come in. So yeah, we're looking at you know we're looking at all these things. So you know you can do this technology maturation. Um, you can put you can do human human tended experiments. Um, you can you can you know see what's going on here in the gap. Um, as for the flight, well, um, I'm just going to let the, the experts tell you how it goes. The experience is something I am personally looking forward to. I can't wait to take it myself. All of the things that I experienced flying the shuttle, all of those phases of flight are there. The boost, the weightlessness, uh, the, the fact that you're up in a pilot seat as opposed to being in the back like a passenger on an airliner. This is more like the right stuff kind of experience. The person who gets a ride on board the Lynx will sit side by side, slightly aft from the pilot. There'll be uh, two sets of controls. Uh, we'll be wearing pressure suits to fly it. It's about a minute after engine light to go supersonic. We anticipate about a 75 degree flight path climb angle that we'll uh, use in our trajectory. Going faster and faster and steeper and steeper. We're going straight up, that's a key element of it. Things happen in a hurry. That altimeter is clicking by pretty darn fast. 70 to 80,000 feet, the sky starts to turn dark. By 100,000 feet, it's gone black. So once we get to main engine cutoff, we'll have a brief period of weightlessness and the arms will kind of float. And then you have several minutes to enjoy the view and, and enjoy for yourself the sensation of being where so few have gone before. We'll get an opportunity to maneuver using the reaction control systems, turn it upside down and pick different attitudes and just hold there. You're going to get a spectacular view. You'll be able to see out to the Grand Canyon, all the way down Baja, California, looking out, seeing the sun glint on the Pacific Ocean, and then from there it's just a long glide back home but looking at the Earth from space. It's virtually life-changing, really the key driver to what will make this experience so special. So that's my time. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions for later. Yeah, we'll do, uh, we'll do questions later. Um, thank you, Kaki. I think it's really um, amazing that um, we got visionaries that are looking to open up space to regular people, including students. I think that's just awesome. So, um, and now what we'll do is we'll talk about the science end of things. Faith is Faith Vilas is going to speak about um, everything that Kaki said she was going to talk about. Thank you. I don't and anywhere near anticipate being as exciting as Khaki's presentation, but let's see. Um, that's the last slide. Uh, okay, so do you have a back seat? Sure, but I don't know. F5. F5. Sit quickly, if you if you watch fast, you'll get my presentation, and you won't have to watch the whole thing. You know? Wow, awesome! What a great idea. No. There you go. Yeah. So, with my collaborator Luke Solid, who's at the Citadel, and myself, we've been working on this for some time, and we have banged on XCOR's door because they have the perfect vehicle for us to use for an observatory or a suborbital observatory, and that's what I'll talk about quickly here. Um, so I, people wonder why an observatory, what is the advantage of that when we've got such things as space-based observatories. Can you hear me? Is this? Okay. Um, okay. So scientifically, first of all, um, the advantages, and this is only what makes this unique. You can point this thing, any, anything in the solar system, anything in the universe, if it's going to you know, be visible, you'll be able to see it. 
But what's unique about observations that could be made with the um, ATSA, our suborbital observatory, are things like our space-based assets can't point close to the sun. They have exclusion angles. Hubble has exclusion angle of 50 degrees. Spitzer was 82.5 degrees. Sophia won't go above the, ultimately won't go above the top of the Earth's um, atmosphere, and it has an exclusion angle of 20 degrees, which is really pretty good, actually. Um, and you have, because if you turn toward the sun and you fry your detector and it's not going to be able to be fixed from the Earth, you've had a bad day in space. You don't want to do that. But there are some things that are unique to looking toward the sun. Um, if you, uh, most of the time in astronomy, if you wait three months, your objects are going to be, because the Earth has moved in its orbit, your objects are going to be away from the sun. But there are some objects that are unique to that area within the Earth's orbit. And like near-Earth objects, inner planets, volcanoid searches, a lot of other things. And these aren't a, an issue for suborbital spacecraft. Um, two types of planetary astronomy observations are, are, the, are useful for this. And I'm going to describe them open field. Your field of view is important, but it's not critical to have exact pointing, but it is important to be able to know something about your field so you have some information. And the other is very target specific, and you require the ability to get your target quickly and keep your target in your instrument. Both of these are probably our most sincere issues that we deal with in design. And um, the success of these will dis depend on the magnitude of the brightness of the target, coupled with the instrumental capabilities and the pointing ability. So things like in Earth, asteroids, Mercury, Venus, you get them pretty bright, down to very faint. Um, there's been a rich history of solar system observations in, from low Earth orbit and suborbital platforms. The advantages to going to low Earth orbit or suborbit is that you're above the water vapor, so you have the access to the full infrared range. You avoid all of the atmospheric effects from the Earth, and you're above the ozone layer and can open the ultraviolet to observers, which is not accessible by many spacecraft at the moment. So why a crude suborbital observatory? Um, NASA has had a long history of, of suborbital science, including observatories. Um, Black Brandt sounding rockets from Wallops Island still fly. Um, the program has had a lot of result, res really good results. Um, crude suborbital craft. You can get a lower cost per launch. You can return your instrument in the same condition as, as it has left. So you can get more flights for the same cost or lower cost per program by inserting man in the loop. So that's why we went for it, scientifically still, technologically. To do this, because we were thinking about it, we took lessons from ground-based observatories and space-based observatories. And from ground-based observatories, um, you end up with two types of instruments, facility instruments or principal investigator instruments. And you have multiple types of observations, observer tended, the sort of standard that the astronomer goes to the telescope and freezes, um, service observing, somebody else goes to the telescope and freezes for the astronomer, or queue observing, it's all put in a queue and the astronomer gets the observation eventually. Um, there's the flexibility with ground-based observations to interact with them and guide the observations. And visiting astronomers are trained on the in-house instrumentation and there's always periodic preventive maintenance. If you have a space-based observ um, observation, they're very heavily scripted. You have very robust instrumentation because obviously you don't main maintenance is not easy in space always. Um, and technical feasibility of proposed observations are reviewed well before they are approved. So how do you migrate this to a suborbital platform? You combine the best of the both worlds, which is what we're trying to do with the ATSA. And the ATSA um, suborbital observatory, or ATSA, it's a facility. It's, we're trying to move beyond the concept of flights or flight or flights only. We want to maintain a telescope or eventually telescopes that are interchangeable with the freedom to attach different instruments, facility instruments that we would have are available in-house, um, principal investigator instruments. You can provide them for the observatory user. Data storage would be on board the spacecraft with the observatory hardware, and the operator can be a guest observer, or we can do service observing. It doesn't matter to us. Um, and we incorporated contributions from both types of observations I just discussed. Um, the observations we observer tended, um, we can do service observing. We have fle the flexibility to adjust the observations. Um, visiting astronomers, we train on the in-house system, and we can do maintenance. And but 
it's it, like space-based observations are heavily scripted. We require robust instrumentation, and we can review the technical feasibility of them. So, Lynx, the X-Core Lynx is the perfect, uh, so far the perfect uh, suborbital uh, spacecraft for us. The transmission on the, um, the spacecraft, the best window is no window, and our ultimate goal is to use the X-Core Lynx 3. It has a dorsal pod, it opens to space, no window, nothing to go through, whatever. Um, for pointing accuracy, the Mark 1 has a pointing accuracy of plus or minus 2 degrees. We can do the fine pointing from there and test out our concepts for the fine pointing. And that's what we hope to do. The Mark 2 and the Mark 3 has plus or minus um, 0.5 degrees, and that's even great. That's even better. The balance requires the coarse pointing with the spacecraft and the fine pointing by the human operator and can be done on board the spacecraft. Um, so what we would do would be to publish a list of criteria for a PI instrument, review the project technically in-house for feasibility, and make this a smooth operation for any interested astronomer with ready instrumentation or with their own instrument concepts. So fiscally, we cut out redundancy. Why? It, you know, it's adaptable. We can tailor future observations to the results from your previous observations. We cut out redundancy. Reflight establishes cost savings because we can repeat use of instruments so they don't get the crash, you know, oh well. Um, onboard data storage removes data downlink costs. The actual flight costs are cheaper. Um, our standardization of observing removes costs of duplicating efforts for lots of different observing programs. So the astronomer can tailor the program to what, um, in our case, uh, the program would be required. And we also have service observing. So what does this mean to you if you want to be a suborbital observer? You want to acquire an astronomical observation now, soon, or sooner or later. And can we do it? We'll run your proposed observation through our simulator. We'll tailor the observing sequence if it looks good. And we'll simulate your expected results and whether or not you get a go, no go decision. And you want to conduct it yourself. We can send you to OTSA specific FAA approved NASAR training for observers with our telescope. Um, we conducted the first OTSA-specific NASTAR training um, 11 to 13 July in 2011. It was the first full class devoted to one instrumentation from NASTAR. And uh, I have to throw in a few pictures, the obligatory pictures. Um, and that's all of us looking, I don't know, I guess I'm looking pretty excited up there in the left-hand corner. And we have students in these pictures. These are students uh, from the summer from the South Carolina students that have worked with Luke. Um, and we also get pressure for the students where Luke was pointing out that if you're a student in college, your facial, uh, your face looks about the same when you're age 20, but when you get into the 40s, it starts looking worse. Um, <laughs> that's without the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you want an astronomical observation, you don't want to go anywhere near a flying tin can, we'll do it for you. You want an astronomical observation and you want to fly your own instrument with our telescope, Give us the specs. We'll see if it's feasible with our telescope, and we will shepherd it through any regulatory processes that are being established. Um, so OTSA 1, which I'll, was what we were testing a little bit, and I'll talk about it, but OTSA 2 is the final telescope. The picture that Kaki showed you was a, um, an artist's concept of um, OTSA 2. It ultimately would have detectors in the UV visible, infrared, filters, grisms, onboard data recording. It probably will have some custom, fab custom fabricated parts, but we were trying to take as much as we can commercially available. Right now, we're talking about it being, like I said, 27 inches in diameter. That's based on what we understand the pod size is. OTSA 1 camera, which is what Kaki referred to as the OTSA armrest camera, but since we got a lot of OTSA lazy boy camera jokes, <laughs> we changed the name. <laughs> um, the OTSA 1 camera is an engineering proof of concept instrument. Largely, its most important function is to test the idea of acquiring and tracking a target from the suborbital spacecraft. And we have a variety of uh, requirements we need to design and build to um, listed there. We cannot impede emergency egress, egress from the links. Most of it, as it is designed at the moment, is off-the-shelf parts. Um, that is inexpensive, but it can be challenging. A lot of it has been designed by some really creative work by undergraduate students, so we intend to incorporate students and have been incorporating students um, with the project. Um, right now, this is the setup for the uh, OTSA-1 camera, um, a Zybion uh, camera that's in the visible near-infrared. 
um, a five position filter wheel. We've got some two inch narrow band filters that will cover a different spectral region and give some science as well about the objects that we go back to look at as part of the pointing. Um, field of view of about three degrees, total weight about eight pounds, and a Questar Field Ranger 3.5 LW ruggedized, really impressive sounding Matsukov Cassegrain telescope, and the filters. Um, we can look at reflectance from Mercury, Venus, atmospheric transmission, a variety of things like that. We'd like to get some working science out of the, the engineering runs. And that's just a picture of what we originally looked at for deployment. Um, there's, uh, for putting out, no, there are no deployments, and that's a different uh, use of deployment. We don't deploy anything. It's, in, it's, it's loaded, ready to go when we launch. We don't have the time for deployment, for, particularly for ATSA-1. We don't have the time to, to spend pulling something out of somewhere or loading it up. We have uh, time to switch it on and then do our work and then switch it off. Um, okay. Um, there's a mechanical system steering by hand. It's on a fluid head camera. Um, and we can take it, we built it so that we can take um, the G weighted pressure or weight of the instrumentation at extremes. So we should be able to accommodate this without being any real serious problem. Um, there's a mock up. We have a mock up of the, that's a mock up of, I think, the links at XCOR when you did some fit testing. Um, we also have a mock up of the Mark I at the Citadel. And we'll have another mock-up of it at the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson. And that's just a student looking at a foam rubber version of something. Of us. And there's our mock-up at the time that we did our fit testing. Um, we do fit. And we had somebody come, to, a couple of people, take a look at it for safety, from the safety perspective for x -Core, And they said, well, you're very uninteresting, which we liked. You know, so we're not any big threat to them. And there's the two of us contemplating something, me and, and Luke Solit, my collaborator. Um, guidance and control design. We need to find where we are in the sky when the telescope is turned on. Um, this is an adapted from source code and we uh, search the space constrained to about five degrees around our chosen sky coordinates and, and we have set it up so that it, we get some software on a display that shows us where we need to, to go and points to it so that we can move that there. Um, it's, it's still under development but it's, um, we want to make it a faster system but this system should work. We've been doing some simulations with it. Um, guidance control, more. We're field testing it now. Um, our, this is just a, I'm not going to go into detail on this. This is just our 11 flights that we determined would be proof, our proof of concept with duplication of how close can we point toward the sun, how, how easily can we find objects and track on them when we are close to the sun. Um, let's see. Above the atmosphere, our period of time is very limited. It is minutes, and we want to emphasize that probably the most important thing we can do is have effective time management. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, we have choreographed this. We'll choreograph the mission beforehand. We understand the timing of critical events to the second. Maneuvers, deployments, everything. It's going to take extensive practice, certainly. And the flight crew needs to be prepared for the rigors of suborbital flight before they go. Um, so we have some human factors training that's also useful, NASTAR, and the goal is just, it's necessary for all operators. And I don't know what, just click anywhere in the view. Just click there. Oh, okay. Probably just have a pretty picture. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've been developing this with X-Core. Um, since the beginning around 2007, at least, and we um, have developed our, we've discussed our flight orientation and our positioning and reviewed with, with the X Core. Um, we have open discussions of requirements for mounting the telescope. We've done fit testing. Um, we don't really anticipate that there's going to be a major problem, although power data cables and routing for stuff from the dorsal pod are still under discussion. Um, in concluding thoughts, it's a practical, useful system. It may fill a unique niche in astronomy. It's not limited to looking close to the sun. That's just what's unique in the one I discussed. It can look anywhere you want it to look. Um, it's the first version of this is being built. and We've been testing it at XCore. Lots of operators will come from research scientists, from the Citadel, from students, from the user community. We anticipate the first plot of Lynx will happen within a year, as Kaki just said, the Lynx Mark One. 
we're ready. We will be ready to fly the Ots One camera no later, probably possibly earlier than fall 2014, and we expect to finalize our design and good function testing by the end of the summer. Um, Atsa, by the way, is not an acronym for anything. It is the Navajo word for eagle, and we chose that. And so that's our. We're real. We have a we have a logo. I said we're real. We have a logo. Oh yeah. 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 In fact, uh, uh, there's a there was a movement for a while at NASA to not name things or give them logos until we were absolutely certain that they were uncancelable, <laughs> because. Uh, it made it harder once you named a, a spacecraft Maven or Grail or something for like to terminate it. Anyway, um, so thank you very much. I don't think I've ever seen anybody go through so much material exactly on schedule. So awesome job, Faith. And I think it's, what we're it's required. It's this, this training to get really tight operations. Done. Yes, yeah. very good. That's right. Because you have so what was it? Three and a half minutes. Um, Right, on the mark one, right. Um, I think, Mike, what we're going to do is we're going to jump to Kevin because it just seemed to fit into the sequence, and then we'll have you um, uh, do the, the cleanup. So, um, Kevin, w why don't you come on up? He's from Waypoint. We added him this afternoon when I realized that uh, uh, he's in the business of or getting into the business of uh, training citizen astronauts. So um, let's hear a little bit about what that's going to be like. Oh, I can take care of that thing. At least I think I can anyway. Let's see. I think I can anyway. All right, here. You are Waypoint. And then I believe um, just uh, forward and back is the left and right buttons. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't kidding. That is bright. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for letting us come in at the last second. I'll try to be quick because um, it's actually National Margarita Day, so I'm sure I'm <laughs> cutting into that time. Um, we live at a very exciting time. Uh, we live at a time when you can actually have discussions about flying to space, space hotels, moon bases, and for the most part, people don't laugh. Um, we even have one of our people that wants to retire on the moon, and when Elon says it, it's real. So we, we've designed a program to, to work in that market, uh, call a supply chain, whatever you want to talk about. So I'll give you a little background, and I'll try to whip through this quick. Um, for most, I don't know how much of you folks know this, but he was talking about space tourism, and this is what we did our research on before we even began this program. Space market is an $82 billion market. Over 16.9 million people visit space attractions, and that can be anything from Space Center Houston all the way to Epcot Center. Futron did a study a couple years ago that said the tourism market is going to be exponential growth. There are 17 companies, and that is increasing, um, building suborbital and orbital platforms for space travel, and there's at least seven spaceports. We either being built or being talked about, and now there's actually one here in Houston that's being talked about. So what's the problem? The Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act um, established that commercial space flights can take, part, take place with the informed consent of those who are flying. There are different debates on what informed consent means, um, but they have to be informed. The FAA requires safety approval of vehicles and service providers like us. Uh, space insurance companies, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but your current policy doesn't cover you if you decide to go into space. So Dennis Tito, uh, from what I read, had to pay a quarter of a million dollars for a separate policy, and that was after training six months with the Russians. And there's no current domestic provider offering fully comprehensive programs like the Russians are currently offering. So why do you need to train? Well, that's debatable depending on who you, who you talk to, but we believe you need to train because it's not about the ride, it's where you're going, which is space. Whether it's a brief experience in a suborbital flight or you're going orbital, you are going to space. It is a very hostile environment and can kill you in a second, so you have to be prepared. So we're all about safety, um, we're all about space situational awareness, preparing you 
for the flight and where you're going. And we want to give you the best bang for the buck. Um, an example is, I, I don't know if you um, follow Ashton Kutcher at all, but uh, he, he went on a, par a parabolic flight and from what I read, he didn't really pay attention to the materials he was given. So he kind of went out and had a few cocktails the night before, had a nice big breakfast, and he said he was uh, seeing his breakfast on um, 15 out of 18 parabolas. <laughs> so he kind of figures he wasted five grand. We want to help you prepare for that. So what's our solution? Well, Waypoint to Space is offering the only fully comprehensive spaceflight training programs in the country. When I say that, I'm saying we are doing pre-suborbital and we are doing orbital which most companies are focused on orbital. We actually have four training programs. We have a space flight fundamentals, which is our pre-suborbital class. This is where you get into the informed consent, where we basically train people for one week. We throw as much as we can at them. You're in the space suits, you're doing the flights, you're weightless, you're doing everything we can cram in one week. So coming out of that, you can decide what you want to do. Was that enough? Or do you want to go suborbital or do you want to go orbital? Most people don't even know they're claustrophobic until they get in one of those suits and that visor comes down and they're like, get me the heck out of this thing. And then we have level two, which is suborbital, and level three, which is orbital. And then we have a payload space specialist internal program where that plays into the research market. We're working with Dr. Alan Stern um, and teachers in space and we're trying to get uh, capitalized on the research market. Uh, we're neutral, which means we haven't aligned ourselves with any of the platform providers. We don't care who wins the next space race. We want to train for the industry. Uh, in 2014, this year, we're setting up our temporary facilities for our level one and level two programs. And in 2015, we're setting up our brand new facility to offer our full-blown orbital program. And as we heard last night, most of those folks are looking to start looking for training facilities in late 2015, early 2016. So our roll art schedule is we're do actually doing demo classes as part of our program. Now, our level one suborbital, I mean, our level one space flight fundamentals class is $45,000 for the week. Now, for some people, that's nothing. For other people, that's a lot of money. So we're trying to reach out to the community and say, we want people to get excited about space again. So we're actually going to have a program. It's going to be a national campaign we're launching next month, which is going to basically send a search for 12 to 24 people to go through our program at our cost and give us the, the feedback. Hey, what did you like? What did you not like? Because once we have paying customers, we need to make sure it's right. So we're going to launch that program and have people be able to just come and apply. Uh, so And then June, we're actually going to launch our full-blown uh, Space Flight Fundamentals program. Um, I, if any of you have ever seen Charlie and the Chocolate Factory uh, and the golden ticket, well, that's, that's our golden ticket. That's what the space flight participants get when they sign up for the program. We're only issuing 300 of these because we can only train 300 people this year. That's it. So once you go through the program, on the back side, you actually get your, your name, your, the date you went through the program, your program number, all of that etched on the back. And we're calling it the Elite 300 program. In August 2014, we start our suborbital training, and in June 25, 2015, we go to uh, orbital. So what are the markets? Well, this, we talked about the space attractions. It's $82 billion. Extreme adventurer market. Most people talk to us and they say, well, this is great, but you don't have a market yet because nobody's flying. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. First thing is you kind of have to train the people before they fly, so you have to have the training programs up and running before these guys start flying. And second thing is, there's a bunch of people, actually 1.5 million at last count, that are bouncing around the planet doing the latest and greatest things, spending anywhere from twenty dollars to $50,000 just to be able to tell Jim, hey, what'd you do last week? Because I trained like an astronaut. <laughs> uh, the emerging markets, of course, are suborbital and orbital. And so those are our three target markets. In the next five years, the extreme adventure market is going to be about 3,700 I mean, 3, people trained, space tourism. And when I say space tourists, basically you're going to look at the extreme adventure market is going to be the bulk of the market. These are people that are just going to be doing it for fun and to potentially fly. And then after five years, you're going to see that flop because a lot of the platform providers are going to be flying regularly. So 
just a little bit about me and why I, I did this. Um, I, I actually worked on the uh, on bidding the DARPA Falcon program, which was the very first program that SpaceX won. We competed against them with my with our uh, space dev streaker. I always hated that name. Um, against their SpaceX Falcon. Now, did they win because they named their rocket after the same proposal? Uh, no, but it just seems kind of weird that they were called Falcon and they were called Falcon. But anyways, so that was the first time I ran into SpaceX. I worked on the Spaceship One program. Uh, uh, Space Dev did the, the motor for that, and they're also doing the motor, which is now Sierra Nevada. Uh, they're doing the motor for Spaceship Two, and that was incredibly exciting, and, I, and that's kind of what gave me the idea for this program. We worked on the Trailblazer Jump Start. It was the very first program for operationally responsive space. When they pulled the, after SpaceX had a couple anomalies, they pulled the satellite, I think it was the Air Force Academy or something, they pulled that off of the rocket, and Space Dev was currently building three satellites for the MDA, and it got canceled. So I arranged a deal to put, take all the pieces and parts of those satellites, make one satellite, throw it on top of that rocket, and launch it. We did it in four months. We built the satellite and flew it in four months. And what was interesting is in, was dealing with the Air Force and them saying, well, you got to do a vibe test. We will when it launches <laughs> because we don't have time. And I'm proud to say I talked my company to having us have our initials etched on the side of that spacecraft, and I can proudly say it is now at the bottom of the ocean. I don't know how many people can say they have their initials <laughs> at the bottom of the ocean on the satellite. It is in a very, very low orbit. <laughs> we bid NASA COTS twice. We actually, at Space Dev, we actually tied for second on the very first NASA COTS run, and we ended up losing to Kistler. And then they rebid it because Kistler went bankrupt again. And we bid it again, and we didn't even make the cut. And then, but thanks to say, persistence means something. They're actually being funded now, so I'm very, very happy of that. Just to give you a little bit uh, kind of small world, uh, that's Dick Rutan up in the right hand next to um, Buzz Aldrin. And when I went to the unveiling of Spaceship One, I brought my father and come to know a small world, my father went through flight school with Dick Rutan, and Dick was first, my dad was second, and they were separated by like just points. And I got to introduce my dad to Bert Rutan as he introduced me to Dick Rutan. So kind of cool. And then I got to meet Dennis Tito and, and of course Richard Branson. He said, man, I'd like to hang out with that guy. <laughs> Um, milestones, we have them too. We've been around for a while. You haven't probably heard of us, but we've been doing this for quite some time. I've actually been working on this for seven years, ever since I came up with the idea. But we've, we've, we've made a lot of progress. We, we've, so far, we've um, um, raised over $800,000, and we're, we're getting our facilities set up. We're signing leases next month for a 10,000-square-foot warehouse. We're ordering our long lead items, and the program's kicking off in June. Working with a lot of companies, too. There's a lot of companies that have actually stepped up and said, we believe in what you're doing, and we're willing to put our reputations on the line because we think what you're doing is valid and important. This is actually a, a rendering of what our facility looks like. If you're from the area, you might happen to recognize it might be someplace close by. Um, we put that because we actually are pitching it to the Houston Airport system as a possible home for it. Um, it's going to have all kinds of cool stuff. It's going to have its own NBE. Uh, NASA has an MBL, we're going to have the MBE, which is a neutral buoyancy environment. It's 100 by 50 by 40 foot deep, and why did we choose that site? Because it happens to be what we need to be able to put like a Bigelow Space Hab, a Dragon Space Capsule, um, Space Dev Dream Chaser, whatever. We're going to have centrifuges, gravity offset equipment, uh, universal flight simulators, classrooms, medical facilities, the works. Um, parabolic flights, jet flights, everything that you've seen out there that have been companies doing little pieces and parts, we're going to incorporate in one single program. So summary, Waypoint to Space will begin training in June of this year. Uh, we're taking reservations now. Uh, it's called the Elite 300 program. And Waypoint trains and prepares you for your flight into space because it's up to you where you take it from there. A lot of people talk to us and they're like, well, do you only train the people that actually fly into space? And that's not our, that's not our job. 
We are training people to fly into space. It is up to you to decide where you take it from there. If the training fulfills your dream, great. If you don't want to fly until years down the road when these folks have been flying successfully and they're on a schedule, great. We're just training you for the space environment and you decide where to take it from there. So the question is, which person do you want to be coming off of your flight? <laughs> so the next step is yours. If I had a rich uncle when he died, no, no, no. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you for pulling that together last minute. I appreciate it. So, so some of you might think, um, gee, what is NASA going to do about all this? Well, NASA doesn't really do anything about this because this isn't in NASA's um, bailiwick. Uh, we might buy flights from X Corps, and we might fund scientists to do research, but if this is commercial space flight, it falls under a different authority from uh, within the federal government, and that's the FAA. And that's why Mike is here tonight. He's going to tell us a little bit about it from the FAA's perspective. And so everybody, please welcome Mike Machula. What's the, the top it's one's the, the, uh, the, the pointer? Laser. Okay. The, and that's laser. the laser. Good. I'll need that. Um, thank you very much for inviting me out here. It's, it's always exciting to get a chance to talk about uh, commercial space. And as you heard from uh, uh, Kevin, Khaki, and Faith, I mean, it is just a great time to be in commercial space. And, and before I get going, I'll, I'll just share with you a little story. I mean, I had uh, been with NASA for 20 years, and I had an opportunity to go over to FAA and, and work in their co commercial space division. And, and I was very excited about it. And, um, and I learned that maybe, you know, some people look at regulators a different way. And, and I found that out when I was on a flight. And so I'm on this, on this, on this first flight I took with the, um, uh, when I was actually working for the FAA, and I had my new shirt. And, and uh, so I'm sitting there, I'm one exit row behind the, uh, uh, one, one row behind the exit row, right? And so the flight attendant comes up, and, and she's, she's, she's talking to the person there, but she's looking at me. And she says, sir, you know you're in an exit row? And she keeps looking at me. And, 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 and the guy said, yes. And she says, and, you know, do you agree to be, you know, that you are willing to execute the, the duties of a, of, that you have to require to be in an exit row? You know, and, the, and the guy just kind of nods his head, right? But she's looking over at me. Sir, I need a verbal answer. <laughs> And I'm, I'm looking at it, and, and so I said, oh, that's kind of strange. Why is she looking at me? And I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm thinking, maybe i got something on my face. or what? And then she goes to the next person, does the exact same thing. And I kind of look down, down and I see, oh, my gosh, I've got my FAA, you know, shirt on. So at that point, I realized that, uh, you know, maybe sometimes, uh, you know, from the government, I'm here to help, as we all joke. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some people look at it a little bit differently. Um, but, you know, again, it goes back to, you know, commercial space, and it's, it's an exciting time. And, and the people that we work with in commercial space, we're all about trying to accomplish the mission and, and get it done safely. And in 1984, um, well, if you can imagine, rewind back from that a little bit, um, before commercial space came along, it was, only, it, was, it, was, it was NASA and the military that launched rockets. And, and we've come a long way since then. But in 1984, um, uh, Deke Slayton was trying to launch a rocket. And he went through, um, I think he had to talk with 18 different federal agencies to try and get permission to do it. And as a result, uh, that in 1984, we pers pa passed the Commercial Space Launch Act. And that was done to basically uh, centralize that responsibility for of government uh, looking at the commercial sector, and it, and it ended up being under the FAA. Um, so what do we do? Uh, essentially, I'll tell you, well, we, we, I'll get into these in a moment, but, but we're responsible for protecting the public, and, and, that's, and that's essentially the heart of what we do. And, and, by, 
in, in the actions we take, we, we license launches, uh, reentries, and spaceports. And so launches are, are obvious. A lot of them take off from uh, Florida, and we'll, we'll, we'll show the map here in a moment, and you'll, you'll see that some of the other places that they're launching from. But um, the reentries uh, are, are new. Uh, SpaceX has been the only commercial uh, licensed reentry so far. And last night you heard uh, Orbital and Cygnus came in, and they, they do a reentry. However, the difference being there is is that their vehicle is intended to fully demise, so it doesn't make it back to the surface. And as a result, there's no public safety issues, and so it's not an FAA licensed activity. Um, and, and spaceports are, are there because they'll provide, they, they can provide a, a, a myriad of, of, uh, of um, capabilities that, that maybe a single launch or single reentry uh, uh, would, would um, I was trying to think, they, they provide a whole bunch of services. So that's, that's essentially encapsulating what the spaceports are, and I'll, I'll show that in a moment. Uh, experimental permits, uh, Congress had us come up with experimental permits. The intent was to make it easier to be able to do experimental uh, development. And so it has uh, less, I want to say less stringent licensing requirements. It has a little bit more flexibility involved in there. Um, and along the way, Above for all those those uh, the permits launches reentries and spaceports we have compliance monitoring we call them safety inspectors, and then we also uh, for rockets that are basically amateur they're below a certain impulse it's like the 200,000 uh, newton newton seconds, and and so basically if you're putting a person on a rocket and you're going to launch at any significant diff distance that it's basically it's, it's going to to not be in the amateur category but some amateur rockets. That, that actually is uh, addressed by air traffic and, and not my uh, portion of, of um, FAA. And so basically, basically what they do in those, those regulations, they basically decide on a certain amount of standoff that people have to be away from it. And they make sure that uh, it's not gonna run into airplanes. Uh, okay, so what we do not do, kind of alluded to it before, is uh, mission assurance. And this surprises people and then also Certified vehicles, and, and essentially it comes into an occupant safety. They all come in, into the into the same kind of category there, and and so it's unlike when you go fly on a plane. When you get on a plane, you expect to get from point A to point B without being harmed. And um, uh, Kevin kind of alluded to it, I think, earlier. We talked about the uh, the um, informed consent. So, so that's one of the, the things that are in our regulations. It says if you fly as a spaceflight participant, so as a tourist, you will sign an informed consent that basically says you have been informed of the risks and you accept them. So similar to, uh, you know, I parachuted and bungee jumped and I signed some informed consent and was happy to do it. Um, and, and so that's, that's along the lines of what happens here. But, but there are certain uh, regulations that, that uh, the companies will have to follow. And, and what we've, we've uh, given waypoint to space is a safety approval. And what that means is that in the regulations it has a certain, uh, the, the, the waypoint to space will provide the training aspect of the regulations. So if you come in, you say, um, I've been to waypoint to space and, and I've gone through the training, then, then you, you essentially check the box for all the regulations that, uh, that uh, are necessary for the, the space flight participant to fly in that, that say that training section. And also, this surprises a lot of people, on-orbit activities uh, are not, so not proximate to launch or entry. So essentially, that's basically uh, the launch occurs, you get into space, and you safely shut down, de-energize your batteries, uh, uh, depressurize your tanks to be safe for its orbital debris reduction. Um, that is, once that's done, FAA is done. And, and so if, if it comes back in with a random reentry, we do not, uh, do not regulate that. And, um, and then we, uh, for example, when SpaceX Dragon comes back in, it's not when it starts undocking from the station that we start regulating or, or start assessing the, the reentry. It's, it's when they start taking action to actually reenter the vehicle. All right, so spaceports. It comes under uh, what we call the Code of Federal Regulations 420 in there, and that's, there's a section if, if you're really interested. I didn't want to, I, I don't want to put them all up here because it'll put you to sleep. 
And uh, you'll really want to go to celebrate Margarita Day. Uh, but I just want to point out, so, so to, for, for a spaceport, there's some key portions of the regulations that you have to meet. So environmental assessment is just, it's the long pole. And, and that's one thing when people come in for what we call pre-application consultation, we start talking about environmental assessment because a lot of times they, gotta, they have to start on that pretty quick if, if they have a certain time frame. It's not like you come in one day and then, th you know, you come out with a spaceport license the next day. There, there's assessments that go on. So uh, environmental is the one thing that, that we can't normally uh, speed up because uh, you have to have some public hearings on it and follow, follow other uh, regulations. And what, what actually can make it easier for, for people is uh, if you go to a certain region that already has an environmental assessment. So last night you heard Chris Ferguson talking about, uh, he was you know, calling up people at a dry lake bed and said, you know, we'd like to use it and land at it. Uh, and and that's, that's great. Um, but then that's one of those things where they, they might not have an environmental assessment. So they, they ha he's gonna have to do some more work there. All right, uh, explosive site plan is basically just making sure that if you have any uh, explosives in the area that, that you're, you're handling them properly. Uh, a flight corridor and the risk analysis of that flight corridor are, are critical. Uh, the flight corridor is making sure that, that you're not necessarily overflying uh, populated areas and then the, the risk analysis is unduly putting them at risk. Uh, you know, most rockets when Say, for example, when they launch from uh, Cape Canaveral, uh, I know, you know the range gives them about 100% failure probability, and, and that makes it very difficult to, to keep, the, uh, keep your numbers low if you always assume that your rocket's going to explode and, and fragments are going to come down in the public. And so, so essentially, uh, what happens is, is so, so companies will uh, do, I'm going to say, take less risky flight corridors uh, for example, if you launch uh, due east from Cape Canaveral, uh, so 20 and a half, you're launching more over Africa. You're not doing a European overflight. And as a result, it's a lot less populated in Africa, and so your, your risk level goes down. Um, if, you, if you do a, a, like a 51.6 inclination orbit you're, and you're launching from Florida going north, um, you're, you're exposing the Europeans to some risk from your rocket, you know, their rocket falling on them. Sorry, the rocket falling on them, and and so that's one of those um, those risks that we have to assess. And, and clearly, it's it's very difficult to meet if if you have not had some uh, already demonstrated performance. Um, it seems pretty obvious, but a launch site accident accident investigation plan, basically how how you're going to handle your, if an accident does occur, and and handling the propellants. Um, that's that's making sure again that the public is going to be safe, and then scheduling and notifications, and and that's a, that's what's interesting is is uh, as I maybe alluded to earlier, this is you know the 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 three launching cap capabilities you know civilian or sorry NASA civilian, uh, the the military and commercial. And so now you get into an issue where, say, you know, the space shuttle wants to launch, and basically that was for the good of the country, and and uh, FAA would would just would would uh, would reroute traffic accordingly, uh, air traffic that being right. Um, now what's happening is is that you've got commercial launches, and as a result, those commercial launches now compete against an airline's commercial service. And so now what the FAA does is, again, it's, we're, we're, we're over the whole uh, national airspace, and we, we do that, uh, we reconcile that as best we can. So really, you know, it's not a good time if you want to launch a rocket anywhere near Thanksgiving, um, <laughs> you know, or Christmas. But, you know, actually, from what I understand, actually, I think Thanksgiving Day is very good because not many people fly on Thanksgiving Day. Um, but that's, that's, what, that's what we do, and that's what the spaceports would do. All right, so I'll give you, uh, basically, there, there are, uh, this is the, the launch and reentry facilities. And, and I'm sorry, I neglected to mention, said if you, if you are uh, FAA licensed launches, you have a commercial space, basically if you're a U.S. citizen launching, uh, you fall under the regulations, or you're uh, basically 51% owned 
U.S. corporation, you are FAA licensed. So, for example, you know, uh, like like Kaki said, XCOR can go launch, you know, many different places. But if they go to Europe and, and decide to launch out there, FAA regulations will follow them. Uh, so we've got eight spaceports. Um, we have uh, Alaska, we have California, Mojave, um, Spaceport America, or Oklahoma, uh, Cecil Fields, uh, Spaceport Florida, and Mid Atlantic. And so it's Mars. And so last yesterday we talked a little bit about that with uh, orbital launching out of there. Um, Spaceport America, uh, uh, Virgin Galactic plans to launch out of there, and then like Kaki said, you know, at Mojave they've got operations out out there. Um, what what do I want to point out here too? Um, here we'll go here. So look at our, our southwest region here, and this is the way FA breaks breaks up the region. Uh, you've got a lot of what, what I want to point out here is that we do have a few spaceports that uh, are, in, are in the region. Uh, you've got, uh, again, you've got Spaceport America, and that's current in Oklahoma, but uh, we've got Midland over here that, that is, uh, they're looking at getting, being a spaceport license. And then what I, I want to point out is that you have uh, Blue Origin and, and uh, SpaceX have launched facilities. Now, they're not spaceports. They are ex what we call exclusive use. And so as a result of it being ex exclusive use, then we just license, they license the launches out of there. We don't license them as a spaceport, so that's one thing. Um, one thing I want to point out here, too, is, is uh, you'll notice White Sands is right here. And air traffic-wise, it's funny because if you've ever flown out to L.A., all the traffic flies right over El Paso. So next time you're doing that, and the reason is is because this is uh, restricted airspace over here. So it makes it perfect for Spaceport uh, America and then over here at Midlands because they're basically in the shadow of this uh, restricted airspace. So, so you know, airplanes don't want to come in and go up and then go around and down around. They, 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 so they tend to fly around this one area. So, so it does help with uh, air traffic and scheduling. And so, so these are the, the area sport, spaceports, like I said. Uh, Midland's uh, working on, uh, they've, they've kind of for pre-application pre consultation, they're working on environmental. Ellington Field has had, uh, they're, they're in pre-application. They're, they're, you've, you've read in the papers that they're looking at uh, submitting their application pretty soon. Uh, SpaceX has had two public meetings down there. One thing I'll say is that the area is, is excited to have SpaceX. Uh, um, seems because, again, it's, it's bringing industry to the area. Uh, uh, New Mexico Spaceport is operational, as well as Oklahoma Spaceport. And then, and then Blue Origin, they're, they're having launches out of there you occasionally hear about, but uh, they're, they're licensed or permitted launches. And um, there's, there's two other gentlemen here that work with me, and we're all uh, based over at JSC. And uh, if you care to talk to us any more about it, we'd love to hear from you. So, uh, Tristan, if you could help us uh, bring the lights back up. What we're going to do is have Q&A now, and what we've done is we've set up four hot seats for <laughs> our speakers. I have a seat there, and um, the mic is here. So, BK, are you going to, between the two of you guys? Testing, one, two. Okay. So, uh, this is time for Q&A, um, and what we'll ask you guys to do is pass the mic back and forth. So, who's, somebody's got the first question, actually the cameraman has the first question, which is very unusual, so we'll go with that. Hi, and thanks for great presentations. Uh, the question is for Khaki. Uh, are you guys rolling your own uh, uh, avionics software? Is it commercial, modified commercial? What are you doing? Uh, yeah, it's called Rick Searfoss. 
<laughs> he's uh, he's our he's our software. Cool, awesome. I used to have some software. I lost a little bit of it. Not joking. <laughs> and more questions? There's one. This question for Mike, please. So Ellington Field, as much as I'm a fan of Houston and that sort of thing, Ellington Field seems very close proximity to fourth largest city in the United States for having a spaceport. Where is, what's their good, rationale for that? Good, uh, good question because uh, you're, you're worried about launches right above you or right over your head. Uh, it, oh. <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. I think of, um, you know, you, you've, we've all seen that Chinese uh, rocket that launched and they launched over a village and it exploded over the village, right? You remember that? And that was done because the Chinese felt that the engineers would be more motivated to make sure that that rocket launched properly. Um, we're not doing that today here. <laughs> that is not the intent. Actually, Ellington has, has uh, said that they would be an air-launched uh, operation. So they'll fly out over the Gulf and, and then launch their vehicles out there, right, and then, and then fly back. So that would be a mode similar to, like, Pegasus. Perhaps, exactly. Where you're carried on a traditional 737 or something and, and then dropped and take off or DC-10. Precisely. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right, so that's how they're able to launch it in this area. And, and one thing, because again, you could have the best rocket, but some of the best rockets in the world only have hundreds of launches on them, and they're still just not, you know, the, the, the failure probability is too high to expose, again, the, the fourth largest city in the United States to, to that kind of a risk. And that's why, like, last night you heard them talking, you know, the, the, some of the best areas, and you saw these spaceports up there, are in more remote areas. Mm -hmm. So while you all are coming up with more questions, I, I guess I have one for uh, XCOR, and that is uh, you've got the Mark I coming, right? And then there's the Mark II and the Mark III. Um, are you going to have more than one Mark I vehicle, or is it just one, and then you're going to move right on to the, to the Mark II or... Are you going to end up assembling a fleet of vehicles? Yeah, the, the fleet's going to be the Mark II. The Mark so II. It, it's possible we might have more than one Mark I's, but in, in general, I mean, the way we look at it is Mark I's the prototype, of, mm -hmm. of which there will be one, and then Mark II will be the production vehicle. Ah. So as we have you know, the need for multiple vehicles, and the idea is to, to fly out of Mojave, fly out of Midland, a, a vehicle, say fly out of those places as well as uh, Florida, um, as well as Curacao. We've got a wet lease with uh, Space Expedition Corporation to fly a Mark II out of Curacao. So as many places in the world as we can fly, we will, and that will be the Mark II. Okay. All right. Questions from the audience now? There's one in the back there. Yeah, hello. Uh, I was wondering, this is towards x -Core. I was wondering, you were talking about the X-Racers. Was there any uh, future with the X-Racer? Was there any future with the X-Racer? Is that what you asked? Um, I, I suppose. I mean, that was, that was, that was the idea. Um, yeah, the Rocket Racing League was a whole other company, and they had a whole other agenda. Our, our goal was just to uh, build a vehicle, build a, and certainly build a prototype vehicle. So mission accomplished. Uh, no, no, we have, uh, it's been essentially disassembled. We have the engine and somewhere is the, the airframe. I think New Mexico is. So um, I'll jump in and I'll ask Faith a question. Um, the, uh, from the traditional astronomy, planetary science community, have you gotten a lot of interest in suborbital observations? Actually, yes, we have we've gotten a lot of inquiries as to it's when, on. Yeah. Okay, it, uh, we've gotten a lot of inquiries into when we're going to fly and when we do fly. Would they please? Uh, would we please let them know because they are interested in flying both to observe things like Venus um, or other ultraviolet observations and in a couple of cases testing equipment ah. detectors and equipment. Like so that. before they go to space full time, they might do some suborbital. Sure. Um, we're very trials. We're very flexible. We're, yeah. You know, right. Uh, uh, what about um, uh, 
science, uh, will NASA or the NSF accept um, proposals for uh, human-tended suborbital flight? Not the less that I've heard of, but I am not banking on NASA or NSF. Yeah, not yet. I'm not, not until they. I'm not constraining myself, or we're not constraining ourselves on yeah. NASA or NSF. All right. Um, Here's one in the front. Uh, FAA question. Um, do you see. On each point. Yeah. Uh, FAA question, do you see the purview of uh, FAA ever changing to include, perhaps once the market is more established, to include the safety of these passengers or whatever the correct is, term is for the people that are going into suborbit, let's say? Yeah, right now, by by law, um, we're not allowed to regulate that. And so, but although it's, it's one thing, I didn't, I didn't mention, like Kaki said, that Rick Searfoss was, the, you know, is the pilot. And, and if you use the the pilot as your means of controlling the vehicle to protect, you know, public safety in essence. I mean, it's, it's ideal if your pilot stays uh, functional. Um, then, then we do look at those sorts of, of uh, uh, to, we do regulate that to make sure that, that basically there's enough, you know, an oxygen supply and, and those sorts of things. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the, f the future. Um, we've we've talked about it within the FAA, and, and, and my boss George Neal has talked about it in sense, and, and you know essentially the the key is is that you know, and I've talked with you know Jeff Grayson, and and, and really is the, the the concern is is that it, is when you put in regulations, if you put in a bad regulation, it it's bad, right? Because it's hard to change it, right? So so the key is we've had conversations right now. If you go out to our website, um, you'll see that, that we have some what we call draft step. We we have the draft version of, um, um, uh, I'm trying to think, so, what is it, human? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Jeff and I worked together. No. So it's a, it's a mouthful. But basically we looked at, you know, across industry and said, what, what are those fundamental items that you want to do if you're flying a vehicle? And, and really, and I think if, if, if regulations do come at that that area, that, that if you regulate at the fundamental level and you let the the fundamentals, dic you know, the, let the companies derive the innovation from those fundamentals, um, I think I think you end up with a with a good quality public safety, occupant safety answer, and it still allows the companies to innovate. Good. Let's see, I'm going to jump in here. Oh, well, there's a question in the audience, and I'll save mine. It's not for you, Mike. <laughs> he knows seat. too much. Yeah. Uh, question for, for Waypoint. Um, if I had the money, I, I, would, I would do it. Um, but I'm trying to figure out from the piece parts that you all provide, I could go um, spend 5k to go fly on uh, suborbital flights. I could go uh, to Disney World and ride in a, a centrifuge on mission uh, space and figure out if I'm going to uh, vomit a lot. Um, I could go scuba diving and, and experience that kind of uh, do that experience. The part I can't probably do is get a spacesuit and figure out if I'm going to freak out or not. Um, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the different parts that you were pulling together and why your business model um, is better than doing all those other things piece part? Okay. Um, there, is, there isn't one Disneyland uh, in regards to, like, there's, there's six flags, there's... Um, Disneyland, there's Disney World, there's Busch Gardens. Um, people who are looking for experiences are going to go do all that stuff regardless of whether we're around or not. Um, but what we have found is it's very hard to, um, to get a handle on, on what training you're truly getting if you're peace parting it out. If you put it all underneath one roof, we know what you're going to go through. We know what you're going to experience. We we because well, we're putting you through it. Um, the FAA. I, I I'm going to have to dispute my friend here because he's from one organization with the government that when they say we're here to help, he actually means it. 
I, I, I mean, we, I've worked with NASA for many years. I've worked with government agencies, the Air Force. I mean, these guys are unlike any other government agency I've ever worked with. We handed them over 600 pages for our training programs, and they went through every single page, and they actually, oh, you missed a comma here. I mean, they were just trying to help. So, I mean, I give these guys huge kudos um, for trying to help the industry rather than hinder it. Um, they're not over-regulating. They're not coming in and saying, this is the way we've done it forever, so this is the way you're going to do it. Um, they're, they're literally trying to help. So with, with, with folks like us, when we handed them this training program, they were kind of like, whoa, all right, um, because it is so comprehensive. And, and like I said, you can, you can part it out, and there's no reason you shouldn't. But if you want to go to one place and you, and you, and you get it all done at, and under one roof and you come out of there n knowing that you, you've covered it all, that's what we're trying to do with our program. So for, um, for you again, Kevin, I'll follow up on that a little bit. Um, I was over at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab just on, um, on Friday. And there... Um, having nothing to do with NASA's mission, but just out of a matter of convenience, there was a, an offshore, offshore drilling company that had to certify their employees that they could egress from a, a helicopter that had made a water landing. And um, so they had employees in, you know, in suits, and they would get into this mock-up of a helicopter, and they would submerge it, and they had to get out, which was actually kind of cool. So. But it's a sort of a side business for the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Do you, do you see um, tangential things uh, coming your way if you're training astronauts? Are there other areas that you might um, actually be able to benefit other place, other companies and um, issues that you could help out with? That's a good point. Um, one of the things we've been, we've been working on for the past four years with JSC uh, through our friends at Jacobs, Amy's over there, um, and HTC, Houston Technology Center, is trying to figure out a way to collaborate where we're not uh, feeling or make, making NASA feel like we're stepping on their toes, uh, where they're not over-regulating and burdening us. So it's, it's kind of a, of a weird relationship. It's, it's taken four years to, to develop. But one of the things that we find where we could implement technologies from the commercial world. Say, for example, uh, you have a suit designer that dev designed a brand new glove, and they just think it's the best thing in the world, and they, and they know if NASA can see it, they'll buy it. But they just can't write a proposal. And they don't, so they get thrown out, right? Mm. It might be the greatest technology in the world, or maybe they just haven't taken it to the high enough TRL level so it doesn't have enough data to be able to support all of their claims. The nice thing about a program like ours is we can literally import, import that technology into our training, and our customers won't know from one week to the next if they're wearing a different glove, but we're going up to them and saying, how were those pressure points? How did that feel? Did you have any tight spots? Did your hands sweat? You know, how did it feel? When, when you're talking about a pressurized environment and you're dealing with a Pillsbury Doughboy type thing, actually squeezing a glove is a really tough thing to do. So being able to do things like that and, and also take the existing technology that NASA does use and amp it up. For example, they have a system called Argos, which is a uh, gravity offset system, and they've been talking for years to integrate virtual reality into that. And we can do that as part of our program and give NASA the ability to come and check it out and maybe use it or, or, or implement that technology back and forth. So it, it really is a, a true collaboration effort. And perhaps physiological research as well, you know, because you're going to have all these test subjects come through. Maybe, um, maybe they'd release their data for the greater good or something like that. Well, absolutely. In fact, I was talking to this gentleman over here about, um, you know, are we going to be opening up our program to people with disabilities, to people that maybe are out of shape, people that maybe shouldn't, fly, how, how can they take part in what they can uh, take part in? And the nice thing about a commercial program is we're, we're not flying the cream of the crop. You know, we've only launched the, the, the Adonises. <laughs> okay. 
can we turn the camera off for a second? <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, and then one of the reasons I started this is because I'm, I'm too tall, and I'm, and I'm not in the best of shape, and I would never be an astronaut. And there's a lot of folks out there like me that are just passionate about space, and, and they would love to be able to go up. And with a commercial program, we, we can train you to go. We can get you excited and to have you partake at any level that you want. And the neat thing about that is we can start collecting data on these people, physiological data, and, and create a database so that we say, you know what, person of your body type, after they fly suborbital, they have a headache for about an hour. But don't worry about it. It goes away. We know because we've got the research. We don't have that research right now. We have a 550-ish or 40 people that have flown into space. And if we're going to be a true spacefaring world, we got to know how everybody is going to react to the space environment. Right. Right. So here's a question. So thanks very much for that, Kevin. So this is a follow-up to this gentleman, and you're, I'm intrigued by the fact that you've revealed that you're going to have this demo class in May, and you've alluded that some of us are not in the best of shape, for, including myself. So assuming we're not in a blackout period for your announcement of this demo selection for 12 to 24, what are you looking for? Can you tell us a little, seeing how we came out tonight, can you tell us in advance a little bit about what your screening criteria will be for your demo class, your test class? Or I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah, uh, a little bit, because we're still, it's still a work in, in motion. Um, I just took advantage of this opportunity to, to, to let you folks know, because, oh, okay, <laughs> great, because I hate that. Um, the only constraint, in all honesty, is the suits. Uh, because we, we can only make them so large, so tall. Um, you know, we've actually had athletes come to us and say, yeah, we're really interested in what we're doing, what you're doing. And I'm like, I'd love to, but you play football and your thighs won't fit in the pants. Um, or you're, you know, seven feet tall. And those guys were like, how much are the suits? I'll buy one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so right now we're buying 14 suits. We have, you know, just for lack of a better term, small, medium, large, extra large. We don't have XXL. Um, I just made sure it can fit 6'4 and below and have 40-ish waist size. <laughs> <laughs> Missed it by that <laughs> much. I got three months, right? <laughs> now with that said, uh, that's just one piece of the program. There's other, uh, other parts of the program that you, people can take part of that, like I said, they may not be able to do it all. But for the most part, we, we want to grow into that, but we've got a budget. We can only buy so much. Um, once the program's off and running, we've got the orbital program going, we can add a lot more capabilities and, and you know, XXL and, and small and stuff like that. But um, in the near term, we're, we're just trying to hit the, 90-ish percentile um, and get as many people involved as we can. Uh, one thing I hated um, when going to these different facilities um, when I was growing up was there was always the velvet rope, you know, and I would look and I would see s stuff going on, but I didn't know if that was an important person or not. Um, if, if something was really going on, because I was so far back. And what we're trying to do is get rid of the velvet rope. If you want to come up and get this close to people that are training to go to space, we're going to give you the ability to do that, because we're going to have two-way mirrors and stuff like that, so these people won't know that they're being watched. Um, <laughs> but So no pressure. But Or if you want to come for the day, and the nice thing about having our own facility is if you want to come for the day and say, I just want to get in the suit and feel what that's like, or I want to go fly, I mean, get weightless. And, and, and what's interesting is with the parabolic flights, you get 10 to 15 seconds of weightlessness. With gravity offset equipment, we can literally put you in any configuration we want and say, get out of it. Because when you're weightless, for those people that have flown the parabolic flights, or you know the first reaction is you're kicking your feet. And all you're doing is kicking your neighbor in the face, and they're probably not going to like that very much. So 
part of the training is not doing these parabolic flights all the time. I mean, that's important, but it's also putting people in these gravity offset that gets you in all these different configurations to say, okay, get out of it, or you're now in the, in the seat, you're now weightless, what are you going to do? How are you going to get over to the window? How are you going to get mm -hmm. that perfect shot? Or now you're by the window and we're coming back in, how are you going to get back to your seat? So all of this is part of the training, and the nice thing about having our own facilities, we can literally offer day training. We can, we're working with teachers in space, so we're, we're on our own dime, we're going to put a teacher through a year and hopefully ramp that up uh, through our program so they can take their videos and their pictures back to their students and show them that it was them, not some astronaut that they may never, ever meet, uh, to get kids excited about space again. We we'll want to work with, with the kids and, and bring them through programs as, as, as much as we can, of course, But because right now our cutoff is 18 uh, for, for the full program, but we can do little day stuff. We have corporations that are looking for team building exercises, so it's, it's a whole gambit of, of things that you're going to be able to do, so it's exciting. That's great. Have we got uh, more questions from the audience? Here we go. Uh, for Khaki, with... Uh, the links you show it going and coming back to the same spot, will you be able to take off from one side of the country and land in the other? And if so, <laughs> how far can you go with the thing? Um, <laughs> not so much the country, but yeah, we've got a, a downrange. I think it's about 200 kilometers. So that's, that's what he's working on. You know, so one spaceport in one location, a spaceport in another. But, uh, but yeah, we've, we've got some downrange capabilities. So does that turn you into an airline then? Well. <laughs> awesome. Okay, here's a question in the middle. Thank you. This, this question is for x as well. I was just curious, since you only have a, a pilot and one passenger, is the passenger going to have to have training on how to fly it in case something happens to the pilot, or do you have some kind of redundancy in the system built to where it can land on its own, or how would you handle that in an emergency situation? Don't say game over. Bad day in space. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, there will be contingencies if, uh, if that happens, but, uh, but the idea is that that won't happen. Um, but yeah, our goal is to be safe. Uh, everyone, pilot and participant, will wear a flight suit, a pressure suit. It's, it, the cabin will be pressurized, but so it's not so much a, you know, yes, you're going to have to do this. It's a, it's a get me down suit. Uh, both will have parachutes, so in case they need to, to fly out. So um, the, the participant will go through a full training. They'll go through a medical screening and they will go through a, uh, a training that we are devising specifically for the vehicle. And is, is there any plans in the future to have more than one? Like are, are you have vehicles that might carry more than just one passenger or? It's, it's possible on a suborbital vehicle but our goal after Lynx is to build an orbital vehicle and that will certainly have more than, more than two seats. Awesome. I'll yeah, it will be that. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? <laughs> All right, then. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming to the Commercial Space Flight Panel. <laughs> and thank you to our guests this evening. I appreciate uh, everything that you had to say and uh, for engaging our group tonight. Thank you again.